which I forgot to start. Um, and the recordings will be up on the website um, afterwards. Um, you can find them there. And at, um, after the end of the sessions, um, the uh, Dominic will be sending out the evaluations for these sessions. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being with us. Um, I will go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Lauren McCullough and I'm joining you from University of Arizona SNAP-Ed or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program Education. So UA SNAP-Ed and I'll let Madeline introduce herself. Good morning, Madeline Dubloy and I'm here on behalf of the Community Research Evaluation and Development or CRED team. Great. So we're just going to jump right in to today's agenda. So first we want to go over a very brief history of where these maps were developed, the why they were developed, but we're going to spend the bulk of our time today going over how to actually use the maps. And then we'll have a little bit of time at the end to hopefully reflect now that we've seen the maps, oriented ourselves to them, how we could actually integrate this type of tool into our program planning as cooperative extension programs. So our goals are very simple for today. We really just want you to understand how to use the map um, because it is a really great tool. And then again, thinking about how uh, we can use that map in our program planning. So diving right into our agenda, we have the history of the map development. Um, so the University of Arizona Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program Education, SNAP-Ed, whether you're very familiar with SNAP-Ed or maybe this is the first time you're hearing this acronym, just know it's a federal nutrition program and it does have a competitive grant process. So that means every few years we have to tell a story of the type of work we're doing, where we are working in communities, and why we are doing that particular work. So we knew our funders wanted to know where specifically geographically we were working and why we were doing the type of interventions that we were in those specific areas. So in order to tell that story, we thought visuals would be a really great tool and maps geographically showing which communities we're working in and the need, being able to describe that to our funders. So we knew we couldn't do this project alone. We certainly not, could not have we could think of the idea, but we could not implement it. And so we knew we needed to partner with the CRED team and I will let Madeline explain who CRED is. So I know that many of the folks in the room have worked with us before, but in the way of an introduction for those of you who may be unfamiliar with us, um, we are CRED, the Community Research Evaluation and Development, that is a mouthful team. Um, and we are a team of researchers and evaluators representing a diverse set of backgrounds. Um, so those skills include geography and mapping, which is how we came to this project, um, but also public health, border studies, education, psychology, much more. Um, we are also affiliated with Extension. Michelle Walsh, who is the CRED team lead, is the um, evaluation specialist for Extension. So our webpage link is there. I'm, would encourage you to visit us if you are unfamiliar with us and would like to learn more. Great, thank you for that overview. So SNAP-Ed and CRED uh, came together to create these maps. And again, I just wanted to highlight why or how these can be such a tool to help visualize data. So for SNAP-Ed, we were able to visualize not only the needs of a community, which areas are you know, high or low income, as well as current conditions. So you'll notice that on these maps, we have actually um, mapped our sites, the places where we're actually doing SNAP-Ed interventions. That data might be erroneous to you, but it was very helpful for us when um, explaining to our funders where we're working. It also helped us to look at potential opportunities, what community partners are in town, where are their farmers markets, gardens, et cetera, and also identify the gaps in, uh, in places where there might be high need, but little service. We did that here in Pima County. We noticed that um, certain areas of town did have limited resources when you actually look at the map, even though they were high poverty. So that makes a great case of why SNAP-Ed should work in those areas. 
So that's a little bit about how we, we use the maps. And now we're going to jump into the bulk of our presentation, which is actually um, learning how to use the maps. Before we dive into the actual visual of the map, um, we wanted to share with you, uh, this is a guide. It's a little busy, but we're gonna be uh, going through each of these components. So I'm gonna pass it over to Madeline to describe what this is. Yeah, so what you're seeing now is on an instruction handout um, that will be posted on the web. It's on both the CRED web page and um, SNAP ads for a permanent resource. Uh, so you can always refer back to this. Um, yes, France and the Francis, the presentation will be shared and Lauren is posting the link to this document right now so that you can um, watch that. But as she posts that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and navigate this in real time for you. So when you open a map, um, you will be prompted to see this and you'll click go and you can ignore that. So every map um, has this menu on the left of the different data layers. So when you're working in maps, all data comes in layers um, and these layers can be turned on and off. So because these were created for SNAP-ED, the layers that you're seeing now are pre-populated um, as active layers. So it's the active sites um, and those are- Alan, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanna make sure, can everyone see the map screen right now? Cause I'm not seeing anything, but it could be on my end. Oh, interesting. It can I get thumbs up on my end? Can I get thumbs up or something from the audience? Maybe I just don't have my Zoom set up correctly. Yeah, I don't think we can see the map. Okay. Are you guys just seeing dark the instructions? See something that says page nine up on the top left. Hmm. Got it. That's my um. This is like the presentation um that I got out of here. So I'm gonna stop share. There. We there. Go. Can we see the map now? Okay, yeah. great. So that's good for us as presenters to know. I need to stop share in order for Madeline to share. Thank you for working that out with us in real time, everyone. Carry on, Madeline. Okay, great. Sorry. So um, this is what it opens to when you open a map. Um, and as I was saying, what you have on the left are the different data layers. So in maps, everything comes in layers. Um, and there are pre-populated layers when you open these because it was for SNAP-ED. So these icons or these little dots are um, the SNAP-ED active sites. Uh, and then these colored layers are what we refer to polygon layers. Whoa, and it zoomed for me. Um, and to figure out what is on, if you scroll through the left, um, you'll see that population receiving SNAP is on, and that's what is covering these polygon layers. You can turn layers on and off by checking these boxes. So if I uncheck that population receiving SNAP, those polygon layers go away. Um, let's say instead I want to look at children receiving SNAP. I check that, and new polygon layers populate. Um, you'll notice to the left of all of the layers, there is a little arrow. If you click that, it expands to tell you what you're looking at. So the polygon layers are all shaded in graded colors. Um, the darker the color, the more of a thing that is there. And for the icon layers, similarly, if I hit that left arrow, um, it opens up a menu to tell you what your different icons are. Um, so the thing about polygon layers or the shaded shapes, which are done on census tracts, that's what the boundaries indicate, uh, is that it's really only feasible to look at one at a time. So it is possible to turn on many layers. So I can turn on children receiving SNAP and population receiving SNAP, and it will overlay them, but that is essentially impossible to interpret. Um, so you really want to only turn on one of those colorful layers at a time. Icon layers, on the other hand, you are welcome to turn on as many as you would like. Um, and it's encouraged to look at icon layers, those little circles on top of polygon layers. So if we zoom back in, um, which you can do using either these zoom 
features in the top left corner of the map, or if there's a specific community that you want to know about. Um, in the top right, there is this little bookmark icon. If you open that, it shows you communities um, that were predefined within a given county. So let's uh, go look more closely at Casa Grande and that will automatically zoom into you. Um, and so you can see where these different icons are populated. And then if I turn on WIC retailers, you can see, for example, where WIC retailers, which are now indicated by the shopping cart are in relation to um, some of those other Arizona Health Zone sites. Um, and if you click around the map, different pieces of information pop up. So right now it looks like I've clicked an empty space, but it's showing me the data that's in that polygon layer. So if you remember, um, I had highlighted children receiving SNAP and it will tell you the information for that census tract. So in this census tract, there are 29.2% of children uh, are on SNAP. And then it gives you the raw number. So that comes out to about 457 children for the number of children in this tract as well as the population overall based on the 2010 census. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth in a bit, but it is the 2010 census population, which as we know is quite old at this point, children that were children in 2010 may not be children anymore. And there are certainly many new children. So all of these numbers should be thought of as sort of a guesstimate rather than a precise actual numerical count. Um, so that's if I just click on empty space. If I click on a specific icon, it will tell me about the data that is loaded behind that icon. So I can see by clicking on the school shaped icon that it opens it up and it tells me about Cottonwood Elementary School, which is here. It tells me the community it's in, its address. Um, and then you'll also notice uh, a, another little arrow here and that will toggle to the next layer that's there. So in this case, um, it will take you to the census tract of that SNAP polygon layer that's underneath there too. So you can figure out the information on that demographic piece for the community that that school is situated in. Um, another thing to learn, uh, in addition to this bookmark tab in the top right, is that recognizing how overwhelming this long list of indicators on the left is, they are partitioned into categories on the top right. So the images are a little bit hard to see, um, but if you hover, it'll also give you um, a verbal explanation. So this little fruit basket is food retail layers. If I click that, you'll see a much more digestible <laughs> set of indicators related to food retail. Um, and county backgrounds shows up in everything. So that that's not particular to food, that's just to help you in case you're getting lost in the map and wondering which county you're in at any given point. So here, again, you can turn things on and off. Um, as on the left, you can expand and see what each of those little icons mean. Um, if you start to get cluttered and crowded, one helpful tip is to come over to the left this little checkbox, you can turn all the layers off, um, which is helpful if you're like, I've checked so many things, I don't even know what I'm looking at anymore and I don't wanna spend the time to uncheck them all. So this one was food retail. Next to that, we have schools and ECEs. Um, so that's a lot about food service programs happening in schools, um, as well as some demographic data on where children are located. The hands, are the community resource layers. So this is one that might be especially helpful to folks outside of the nutrition programming. Um, if you are looking for places to do literacy program or senior programming, or just where in the community are there things where I could be um, offering some extension-based programming, this is a helpful layer to have. So we can turn on libraries, uh, YMCA branches, recreation centers, and you can explore those in a community of interest. Much of the demographic data is in this layer. Um, and a lot of these are polygon layers. So for example, if we turn on households with no smartphone, you will see colors show up. Again, darker is more of a thing. So um, in these darker places, over 80% don't have 
um, smartphones and they'll give you the exact percentage in here. So households with no smartphone, oh, I guess that's a medium purple. So I will say that the gradations can be kind of hard to tell when they're not all <laughs> lined up next to each other. So it's helpful to, to open that menu and see what exactly that percentage is. Um, and then you can always close what you're looking at through the top right. Um, and then there's also economic need layers. So if we wanna explore say where low-income families are most densely populated in Casa Grande, or if you wanna explore another community, we can do that and let's say, let's go look up in Apache Junction. It will zoom the map to us and it will show us by census tract um, where the greatest density of low-income families is. Um, and the legend, if you wanna see everything that you have turned on at once, you can use this legend icon. Um, the map has a few other special tools, um, one of which is this little octopus down at the bottom. Um, there's not a lot in my screen right now, so I'm going to turn on a few other things like the WIC retailers and the SNAP retailers. Um, so this little octopus icon in the bottom of the left of the map summarizes any information that you have turned on for you. Um, the important caveat about this is that it is extremely sensitive and tied to what you are seeing on your screen. So even though I went to the bookmark and said Apache Junction, it is counting everything that is visible on my screen and nothing that is not visible on my screen. So you sort of have to work in a rectangular dimension. And if you, with your on the ground knowledge say, well, Apache Junction doesn't really extend over here or down here, um, you either have to zoom in to something that you feel is a good approximation. You'll notice that as I zoomed, the counts changed because it is counting what is appearing in your window. Um, but it's a helpful way to get a quick summary of what you are looking at. And then if you know the community boundaries that, of the community that you want to define to be a little bit different, you could always go and hand count within there. Um, and it shows other layers that you could have turned on to summarize, which are not turned on right now. So they're not being counted. Um, just to give you a sense of what's in there. So all of those icon layers where things are located at discrete points can be summarized here. Um, another handy tool is this little drawer at the very bottom. Um, typically when you open this up, it will summarize the data for the different layers you're looking at. Um, we've noticed that it recently is defaulting to only putting in county level data, which is not super helpful, um, but the workaround right now is if you go over to a layer that you're interested in and say um, view in attribute table, which I got to by clicking those three dots on the right. If I view that in attribute table, it will tell me by census tract for everything that you're looking at in your window again, um, the different data that you might have been toggling through if you were clicking tract by tract. So this is a quick way to sort of get the sense overall of what you're looking at. And each of these columns is sortable. So if you wanna know, okay, which of my census tracts has the greatest low income population? Um, if you find that table header and click on it, you can sort ascending or descending. Um, and then you can figure out which of your tracks has the most dense population of low income folks. Um, the one other type of icon that it's worth explaining um, are what's called a proportional icon. So as I turned on the National School Lunch Program sites, you'll see that it didn't add in a whole new census tract of color, and it didn't add in a very precise little dot. Um, it added in dots of varying size. So I'm going to turn off all the layers so you can see this more clearly and turn that one on again. Um, and these are what are called proportional icons. So these are sized by the amount of whatever is happening there. So right now we've turned on the National School Lunch Program sites. So this bigger dot 
has um, about 531 national school lunch program meals per day compared to this much smaller dot, which has about 113 national school lunch program meals per day. So the smaller the dot on these proportional icons, the smaller the amount of that indicator. And I think that covers all of the things that are in here for now. So I know that's a lot um, and we'll be doing some demonstrations. Um, and if you have questions or if you know that you want something reviewed again in particular, you can make a note of that in the chat. Back to you, Lauren. I'm still muted, there we are. I will go ahead and share my screen again. Can I get, I'm getting confirmation on my end that you can see it. I'll look for a thumbs up, but we'll carry on. But this is still to you. Um, Madeline's gonna get an overview. Thanks folks, I appreciate the thumbs. Um, Madeline is going to give an overview of uh, some of the things that she had mentioned to keep in mind about the data. So Madeline. Right, so the maps are loaded with data and it's really tempting to think that this tool can answer all sorts of questions in fantastic clarity. And while it is a really helpful tool, it is not a perfect tool. Um, and that is because the data that underlie the map are not perfect, no data ever are. But some specific caveats to keep in mind for the data that are presented here. Um, so the demographic data in particular come from the American Community Survey, which is a product of the US Census. It is done more frequently, but instead of it going out to everybody, it goes out to a sample of people each year. Um, and so when we're sampling um, in communities, there's always some question about how representative are the people in the sample for that whole community. So statisticians, take the sample and try to extrapolate up to what is likely true for that community. Um, but it is not as though every single person in that community has reported on their low income status, for example. Um, so everything should be sort of considered as, a, again, as a reasonable estimate, the best estimate that anybody has, but not a fact per se. Um, and it's especially true that in smaller communities, um, so, you know, some of these census tracts that might be in rural areas where there's a much smaller number of people um, and um, in communities with high de densities of um, Latinx and Native American populations, folks who are traditionally less likely to respond to census inquiries about information about their household, the information on those folks and in communities um, where the population is dominated by those folks, the data may be especially wobbly or um, low quality compared to if we knew the truth about what was actually happening on the ground there. Um, also, the data are represented in census tracts. Again, that's a common and useful way to do things, but it doesn't necessarily align with actual community boundaries. So it could be that when you're looking at the map, you might say, I know this particular neighborhood to be a hot spot of child poverty, for example. Why doesn't it look that way on my map? Um, and that could be because the census tract includes that community, but also other communities where there is much less child poverty. And so the dense poverty in that one community might be washed out by other communities in that census tract. Um, so just something to be mindful as you are navigating around the map and trying to reconcile what you're seeing on the map with what you believe to be true otherwise. Um, also on here, if um, early childhood and education providers are a particular interest of yours, there are layers, again, that you can turn on to see where home-based ECE providers are but because you wouldn't want your child's home-based provider uh, to appear exactly on a map, those providers are located um, in the general area, specifically the zip code that that provider is in, but the dot for that provider does not correspond to the actual location of that provider. So it gives you a sense of the area of the provider without divulging any potentially sensitive information about that provider. Um, 
you um, also, for some of these things, we lack a centralized data source. So things like farmers markets, um, it says multi-source in the legend, and that's because there was a combination of sources that have to be pulled to try to triangulate where farmers markets actually come from. Um, and so that's another case in which the data are, are our best guess as to what's there, but um, fluctuate from year to year in a way that just big data systems don't keep up with. Um, data display wise, you may have some instances where you click on something and the percentage appears as a decimal. So sometimes it will look like the percent of folks on SNAP is 0.57% of the population. Um, that is just a glitch within this interface and that should be read as 57% of the population. Um, there's there's really nothing out there that's under 1%. So if you're seeing tiny fractional percents, you should just ignore the decimal there. Um, and particularly about that SNAP enrollment data, um, the numerator and the denominator that we use to calculate the percent of folks enrolled in SNAP come from two different sources. So the SNAP enrollment or the numerator in that fraction are from 2018 but the denominator on how many people there are come from the 2010 census, again, because that's the best count of how many people are actually in a tract. But you can imagine the amount of population change between 2010 and 2018 means that sometimes it's possible to look like there are more people on SNAP in a tract than actually lived there in 2010 in tracts of high growth. So sometimes you will see 110% like of people in this tract are on SNAP. Um, and just to be mindful that's what's happening there is that the denominator is an older data source um, and is not necessarily aligning with the current SNAP count. Uh, so again, treating it all as guesstimates. Go ahead, Lauren. Great, um, thanks. That was a lot of information to absorb. And I think the summary of that slide is basically that, you know, the map data can't be perfect. No data is perfect. And therefore um, it's a good guess, it's a good tool. Um, but of course we always need to fact check it with what our community is experiencing, what we know to be true. And we'll talk a little bit later on about, about that. Um, but we do want to provide, we know that that was like a mega download of information in terms of actually orienting ourselves to the map. There's a lot of little components. So we're gonna spend a little bit more time in the map now. Uh, I, I'm passing it back to Madeline now, but we also want to um, look at the map now that we've kind of just said, okay, I, I, I see there's layers. I know how to click things on and off. I'm, I'm getting there. We want to go back and look at the map, but with fresh eyes, with these questions that we can consider when we're looking in the map data. And I'll pass it to Madeline. We're going to review these questions, and then we're going to move back to the map interface. Sorry, I was getting ready to share my interface. Um, yeah, so as we navigate the map, especially with these polygon layers, it's helpful to think about where you're seeing high and low values. Um, one thing we always encourage folks to think about is what factors are explaining the visual patterns. What do you know about the places that you're looking at that you can bring to bear on the map and the information that is being displayed there? Um, what questions are being generated as you look at the map? And making note of, you know, oh, this surprises me um, because the map, again, is not a perfect tool. So it is possible that there are errors in here, more likely with things like farmer's market location or an ECE provider location, slightly less likely with those big administrative data sets or census-based data sets, but not impossible. Um, and really making a note of those curiosities and the questions they spark. So let's go back to the map. Um, I should also add that everything that I just caveated about the data in the map is also in that instruction sheet that Lauren put the link to chat, put the link in, in the chat too. Um, so you don't have to remember all that because that's all explained in detail. So I thought we would um, go ahead and do an example of navigating. And I was curious if anybody had any burning questions that they wanted to try to answer with a map. Um, so if you do, 
if you want to pop that into the chat um, and let me know your community and something that you'd like to explore and I can demonstrate how you would go about finding some of that information. I'll give folks a couple seconds to think about that um, and then I'll jump into another example if nobody has a burning desire, um, but you can continue to put things in chat and we can do multiple examples as time allows. So I'll ask Lauren to sort of monitor the chat and let me know what questions might appear. So I don't think any, um, any burning question has popped up. So let's go ahead and take a look um, at something that we have realized through our work with rural communities is a big issue, especially in this time of um, remote everything. Uh, I wanna look at some of the internet access throughout uh, the state and then some specific communities. So even though I've worked with these maps before, I still get weary scrolling up and down of these layers on the left. But I do know that it is um, what we'd consider a demographic layer and the households uh, with no internet access. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this no internet access layer on. I'm gonna close that. And I'm gonna see that I get a decent variation in range. I wanna see how this looks like across the state as a whole to see if I'm thinking statewide, what kind of pockets of internet access might be happening. And once you're zoomed out, you can really see some high and low areas start to emerge. Um, you all are seeing what I'm seeing, which is that it's taking a while for the middle of the map to fill in. The program, because there is so much data underlying, it can be a little bit sluggish at times. Uh, so depending on the quality of your internet connection, you may have to be especially patient as things are loading. Um, and we can see that, you know, central Arizona looks reasonably well connected to the internet, but that in the tribal communities, there are some real um, lacks of connectivity. So if I click on this census tract, for example, um, I can see that 16.7% of folks reported having an internet connection. Uh, and some of that is satellite, and some of that is dial up, and some of that is cellular data. And that 83, then inversely, do not have reported access to the internet. Um, and so, when thinking about programming and how you are disseminating your information or how you are asking people to complete surveys, um, likely that other methods would be needed instead of just either something on Qualtrics or something distributed via Facebook or email um, because folks in certain pockets of the state are much less likely to receive it. Um, I think this is also a good time to, in, to demonstrate how important it is to zoom back in. So the Phoenix area, when we're really zoomed out, looks like it has strong connectivity. But as we zoom in, um, and get closer to these small census tracts. So the census tracts try to have a roughly equivalent number of people across different tracts. So in dense urban areas, the tracts are much smaller compared to um, much more dispersed rural areas. The tracts are geographically much larger to try to catch a similar number of people. Um, so even in Phoenix, which we would all consider a major metropolitan area, there are tracts where 64% of the households that responded to the ACS are reporting that they don't have internet service. Um, so, you know, checking your assumptions as a program that just because you are working in an urban area that you can rely on digital means to either conduct your programming or to communicate the availability of your programming, um, you know, that that is a dicier assumption even in some urban areas. All right. Are there other questions, Lauren? Yeah, Madeline, um, what came through in the chat was a uh, request about internet access in Yuma County. Okay. Um, so same topic, but Yuma County. And I think that could be a good opportunity to describe, um, which we'll get into later, uh, how to find Yuma County. Yeah, <laughs> so 
if I switch tabs, you guys can see the tab change, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's a really good point. Um, because these were created for SnapEd, they were created in communities that SnapEd works with, which you will see Yuma is not among the ones listed here. Um, so there are some indicators that are not available in the handful of counties that um, SnapEd didn't work with, but layers like internet access, which come from the census and come from national data are available. So right now I've opened Pima's map um, just because I know that Pima is close to Yuma and I can scroll over to Yuma and you'll see that those polygon layers remain populated. So um, as I mentioned, when it opens, it opens with pre-populated snap ed relevant layers. I can use this top menu to turn them all off and say, no thanks, I don't wanna care about those right now. Um, I wanna care about internet, which again is in my demographic layer in the top right. There I'm gonna do no internet access, but you have the option to look at internet access. I think it's a little easier to digest to look at no internet access. Um, and so I turn on that layer. Um, and actually here's, here's something helpful because I'm not actually sure where Yuma starts and ends. I'm going to turn on the county backgrounds which will draw lines for me uh, and tell me, okay, Yuma is over here. Uh, so then I can zoom in a little bit more to try to look specifically at Yuma. Um, and again, you can see out here, giant census tracts and in the more central areas where the population is much denser, much smaller census tracts. Um, and so if we look for sort of those hot spots, um, and you can again, turn this legend on to um, cue you into what colors mean, what percentage breakdowns, um, but once all said and done, discerning between <laughs> level three pink and level four pink is a little bit hard. So easiest to just click on a census tract of interest and say, okay, this pink means that 45% of households don't have internet. Um, and to take this example a little bit further, maybe you say, all right, I wanna know households don't have internet there, but what about places where people could go to access the internet? Um, and I'm going to look for my community resources. So this is the helping hands in the top right. And I'm going to turn on the public libraries layer. And there I can see that, okay, this um, community here supposedly has pretty low internet access, but there is a public library there. Um, and so maybe folks are accessing information through that public library, which typically do come with internet equipped computers. Other questions that we would like to collectively explore? There was a question in the chat related to the Phoenix example. Is that lack of internet in Phoenix from lack of funds or an internet provider? So we don't know the why for that question. Um, let me see if I still have it there. So I was actually curious um, about the questions that are getting asked. And so I had pulled this up yesterday it's probably pretty small. Oh, let me try to zoom in there for you. Um, because this question in particular, I think is so interesting. And so this is the data that folks are asked. So at this house, apartment or mobile home, do you or any member of this household own any of the following types? They could check a desktop, smartphone or tablet. Um, and then from there, they're asked, do you have access to the internet? And they could say yes, either by paying a cell phone company or internet service provider, yes, without paying a cell phone company or internet service provider, or no access to the internet at this house. So the data underlying this question about internet is just a yes or no. Um, and you can filter back in the maps. Um, you can look at the smartphone access if you wanted to try to drill down a little bit further on who was accessing things how potentially. Um, so we could turn on smartphone only uh, to give you a sense of places where people 
are using their smartphones and thus are working on a really tiny screen. And if you send a Qualtrics survey, they probably don't want to type out a long open ended answer on their smartphone, even if they do have internet. Um, so there's a little bit of extra context that you can get to what internet or internet accessibility looks like within a census tract, but not really that why from the data that are in the maps. Great. Well, I think um, to keep with our time, and I don't see anything else coming into the chat for requests, we can switch back to the presentation. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And um, I just want to thank Madeline for going through those examples. Hopefully they were helpful to people to see, uh, again, just kind of running through how you can use the map and then some of those questions. And I just want to link back to the questions that we were talking about um, to think about when reviewing the map. And some of those natural questions came up like, um, you know, what surprises were there in the data? Well, it was surprising to find out there are some places within Phoenix that, you know, have very low internet access um, given what we think of as an urban area. We started kind of guessing, well, what are some factors that may explain those visual patterns? Like, is that an internet service provider? Is that that people don't have the funds to pay? And we may not always have those answers to the whys, but I think it's important to ask those questions as we're reviewing the map. And maybe those are conversations that we could start with our communities in those areas. Like, hey, I noticed that there's not a lot of internet access. Do you all have internet access? How would you like us to communicate with you? If we have events, do you access our Facebook page? Like following it up and asking um, folks, you know, what you see in the data and, and what people's lived experiences in those areas are. So now that we've spent a little bit of time talking about, you know, the map, how to orient ourselves, how to use it, we did want to open it up. And this is Hopefully, hopefully some people will feel excited to come off chat and uh, or come off mute or pop in the chat and uh, say, you know, now that you're familiar with the maps, you can see what they can do. How do you envision using these maps in your own program planning? Are there ways that are you making those connections now um, or we would just like to open that discussion? If no one says anything, I am prepared to speak, but I am very comfortable with long pauses in and silence. So I'm going to give you all a few more moments and then I'll just share a little bit more details about how we used it. So Stephanie did put in chat that she's from Pima FNIP and would like to make resource maps for her participants. Stephanie, would you mind sharing a little bit about what kind of resources you would want to have on the maps and what you would want to be directing folks to? Hi. Um, yes, so specifically things like food banks and food pantries um, so that we can direct our participants to the closest ones in their area. Great. Yes, we definitely have that data on there. Uh, specifically for Pima County, which we'll talk about in a moment. While other people might be thinking, I can share um, that we obviously use these for a grant application. And you can imagine that when you are trying to summarize to a funder um, why this area has a high need of a certain area of a certain topic area, maybe um, it's a food desert. And that is one of the uh, layers that you can click is actually seeing food deserts. And just as Stephanie mentioned, you know, food pantries or food. Uh, food banks and those types of areas, farmers markets where people can use um, their double up SNAP dollars. You can see that those places are absent in a certain area uh, as well. So that that was one, you know, why am I making the case that we should fund our program to do food systems work or outreach or capacity building work with 
uh, nonprofits or other people in the area to kind of build up those food access and food security resources, why should you fund us? Well, here on the map, you can see this is a high need area, low food access, and there's no food resources in the area. With one snapshot, you can tell that story. And so that's what we were focusing on in our grant application was trying to tell that story of why we were proposing to do the specific type that we are type of work that we are doing in those areas. So screenshots of these maps can um, really uh, tell your story to your funder. Does anyone have anything else before we move on? Okay, you're off the hook, we'll move on. <laughs> so I did also want to, um, I appreciate that the questions have already come up about Yuma, Coconino and Gila County, as Madeline had shared her screen and showed you all that uh, there aren't exact like links to the maps because they, they aren't a part of the SNAP-Ed grant, um, uh, grant application, which is why these maps were created in the first place but you can scroll over and find your county and all of that census information is loaded. And I also wanted to just caveat that if you are exploring the Pima County map and then you go to explore another county map, you might find a lot of uh, what we would call bonus layers, um, extra information. That's just because the city of Tucson as well as the Pima County Health Department has a lot of different GIS data available. They have their own GIS team and they've been creating maps relevant to transportation and just other uh, data points. And so we grabbed that data and put it on our map as well, just because we wanted, we wanted as much information as we could. So you might see that there are some things that exist on the Pima County uh, map that might not exist on others just because of our, you know, collaborating with CRED and, and being able to customize it in that way. Um, so I'm going to actually drop, or Madeline is going to drop the link in the chat of where you can find your map so you can go ahead and start exploring if you haven't um, already done that. And uh, we'll also be going over, there's the link. So you can uh, click that link and that'll take you to the homepage of where you can find these maps. So if you wanna bookmark that, you can now. And then we're gonna share some other resources with you to end. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so, as Lauren mentioned, not everybody has bespoke map, but you can navigate to those. Also listed on our page, um, we put this together and shared a little bit about it actually at last year's extension conference when we were in the thick of pandemic lockdown uh, and nobody was going anywhere, but still needed to do some needs assessment on a variety of different data sources that you can explore digitally to get at similar kinds of information. Um, Mag, the um, Maricopa Area Association of Governments uh, has a dashboard that also includes a lot of data for beyond Maricopa um, and has useful interfaces that you can navigate and try to get at some of that data as well. And those are all linked there. Um, we also are always open to the opportunities to have a conversation with you about what would be helpful to your program and talk a little bit more about what a custom project, whether that is a flat map, um, we've done fact sheets for communities or an interactive map like these or a data dashboard. Um, those are all within our wheelhouse. Um, and so you, if you have ideas about something that you would like to provide for your clients or stakeholders, um, definitely reach out. Our contact information is both on our web page um, and also listed at the end of the presentation to start that conversation. Great, thank you. And I can attest they are wonderful to work with. Um, they do great work and we've really appreciated collaborating with them. Um, so that there's your testimonial to working with CRED. Um, now, another project that CRED and, and our team have collaborated on is community engagement. And I consider this a resource to share with, uh, to, to work in conjunction with this map on multiple levels. One is that we talked a lot about what you know to be true about your community, as well as the lived experience of folks living in those communities and what the map data says. 
So on one level, the map might reveal something that you might want to dig into deeper with your community. And to do that, you'll want to do some um, effective community engagement. So we knew that uh, the maps was only a piece of the puzzle, but we also wanted to uh, work with our communities. Can you see the screen? Yes? OK. So these are our community engagement learning modules. And what you'll see is that each of these modules is a short video, so under 10 minutes. They have um, various topics, just an introduction to community engagement, as well as digging deeper into um, how to start getting to know your community. And one of the first stops on that journey of getting to know your community is mapping who is in your community. And from here, you can see once you fill out some information about who you are, because we want to know who's using this resource, um, you'll see, oh, it's loading slow on mine, probably because I have so many tabs open. Here's the video. You can see there's a little video embedded in here. So everything that we just went over, if it felt like so much information, you're going to click into the map and you're going to get overloaded. You don't remember what all those tabs and icons and polygon layers were. All of that information is reviewed right here for you in the video. And uh, it's a great resource to just refresh your own memory, staff that weren't able to come to this presentation, onboarding of staff of how to use the map um, when you have staff transition. So all of that is right there for you. So included in uh, are some links to that. Um, let's see what's in the chat here. Great, Madeline already put that in there. Thank you so much. And then um, another important thing to note is that in the future, we are actually turning all of those modules into extension publications. So if you prefer a learning module, if you prefer to just read the information, we're going to have the information available to you in multiple formats um, here soon. That's on the horizon. We're still authoring them at the current moment. And finally, just to note that um, these maps, the community engagement learning modules, as well as all of our SNAP Ed publications, they're all under the outreach tab um, on the Nutritional Sciences uh, webpage, which I'll pull that over here. So I also want to note, um, just a shout out to Nutritional Sciences is now a school. It's the School of Nutritional Sciences and Wellness. So here I am, um, formerly the Department of Nutritional Sciences, so yay. Um, here I can navigate to the Outreach tab. SNAP-Ed, FNAP, and the Diabetes Prevention Program are both there, but to find these resources, you'll click on SNAP-Ed, and you'll find our county maps. Community Profiles is a previous um, project that uh, the CRED uh, partnered with the AZ Health Zone at the state level. We have our publications, including a full citation list should you need it, and our community engagement learning modules are here. Also, a big thank you to our IT specialist, Tate Hansen. He helped us get this web page looking as organized and, and nice looking as it is. So all of that is there should you need it in the future. And on that, unless we have anything, any other questions or anything to add, we will go ahead and say thank you. Um, and we're open for any questions, or you can buy back your time and get a little bit of time until the next uh, event today. Thank you guys, that was so amazing. That was a lot of information and um, I appreciate your presentation and all the participation from everybody attending. I'm gonna just um, stick the um, cooperative extension link. Oh, it doesn't look like it linked it. Um, in the chat, if you need to schedule the rest of your day, um, we have um, a lot of stuff going on this afternoon and then tomorrow at one, We'll be resuming with a few more breakout sessions. But thank you so much, Madeline and Lauren. Um, that was fantastic. I really appreciate all that information. I'm going to try one more time here to, to give you the link. I don't know what happened there. I don't know. That's weird. Very strange. You should be able to copy and paste it into your browser, and it'll still work. Yeah. It just seems like it should be a live link, but it doesn't look that way. It's, yeah, yeah. Technology yeah. is great yeah. until it's not. There you go. How about that one? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, everyone have a, a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.